David Aiken here with Check Red Brewing and another tips and tricks video for brewers around the world. This is my chance to share with you some of the information that I've picked up over the last five or six years of brewing so that you can glean from my experience and try to avoid some of the mistakes I've made. Today we're going to be talking about temperature control during your fermentation and why it's so important. So the temperature that you're fermenting at is directly linked to the style of yeast that you're using and what kind of yeasts are there? Well. A couple of years ago, I picked up this great t-shirt, and I'll see if I can find it on the internet again and link to it in the notes below. But this is the periodic table, a fun play on the periodic table, but instead of the elements, it's got beers from around the world. Now, on the opposite side of the shirt, you'll see that it's basically broke up into two different categories, lagers and ales. And this is where the conversation about yeast really starts. Now, the ale yeasts like to be in the sort of 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degree range when they're fermenting, and the lager yeast likes to be around 12 degrees Celsius or 52, 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And those temperature differences mean that the beers ferment out in a much different way. Lager yeasts work at a slower pace because at a lower temperature everything moves slower, and ale yeasts work a lot faster. They are also, the activity in a lager yeast happens at the bottom and the, the activity in a ale yeast happens on the top. So there's a lot of different factors involved. And how do you decide? How do you decide which yeast to use for which beer? Well, there are some great online charts. We're gonna take a look at one right now. So on the Brew Your Own Beer Magazine's website, there's this fantastic home brewer yeast strains chart, which I love. There's another great one on uh, Brewer's Friend that I like as well, but I prefer this one because this is it. You've got a list of different beers that you want to select or the kind you want to make. You make your selection, say a double IPA, for example, you hit submit, and then it accesses a database of the right kinds of yeast for that particular style of beer. And it's great because you've got the, the lab that makes it, you've got the fluctuation rate, the attenuation rate, but most critically, you've got your temperature range. Afterwards, you've got a bit of a description as well. But again, it's the focus on the temperature range that we're really after. The uh, ale yeast here is going to be in that sort of 18 to 22 degrees Celsius or the 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That kind of a range is going to give you a good result. And then let's go to a lager. So American lager here and hit the submit a button again. And we've got another bunch of different yeast strains, the lab that makes it, the fluctuation rate, the attenuation, a little description, and the temperature range. And it's in that 50 to 55, or sort of in that range. So that sweet spot in Celsius of around 12 degrees. So each of these yeasts has a temperature range that it really likes to work at. So why is that temperature range so critical? Well, if you ferment above that temperature or, or in the high end of that temperature, you're gonna get a lot of esters, these fruity esters and maybe some fusel alcohols out of the yeast production, which are not flavors that you want in your end beer. It doesn't matter if you're using a lager or an ale yeast, put the temperature too high, those fruity esters are gonna come out and those fusel alcohols are gonna come out. Now, if you drop the temperature below that range, what's gonna happen is that you might get a stuck fermentation. And then if the fermentation, you know, you don't know, you hadn't checked the attenuation of it, you put it in a bottle and then maybe it starts kicking in again, the extra residual sugar that's in that liquid is gonna be in, in, in potentially a bottle that could turn into a bottle bomb. Not a good idea. I'm sure uh, many home brewers, myself included, have had those bottle bombs it's really something you want to try to avoid at all cost. The internet is full of different ways you can potentially control your temperature, but I'm going to show you the way I did it. I got myself an old chest freezer. This one probably came off of Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. I can't really remember. But if you're looking for one, check with friends, check with family. These things come up fairly regularly and you can pick them up. Sometimes you can get them for free and sometimes they're like maybe $40, $50, whatever. Keep looking until you get one that's in your price range and will fit a fermenter. Now, these brew buckets are great. They'll fit into just about any chest freezer, as will these glass carboys. It's just a matter of finding one that's gonna work. So, the chest freezer gives you a fermentation chamber to work with. Now, you need to be able to heat it up or cool it down depending on the temperature range of where the liquid is. So, here's how you do it. First step, get yourself one of these. I'll link to it in the notes below. I'll send you a Amazon link so you can find these. This is an ink bird controller and you've got a temperature probe and you've got a plug and you've got these two outlets for plugging stuff in. 
So the temperature probe, you want to put it either into a heat thermal well, like a thermal well like that, in your fermenter itself, or I use a towel on the outside of a carboy so that it's plugged in next to the glass as close as possible because you don't want to have it being affected by the ambient temperature in the fermenting chamber itself. So you've got your temperature probe, you plug it in, and then you've got on this two different settings or two different plugs, one for heating and one for cooling. Now obviously for the chest freezer, you're going to plug the cooling into the chest freezer and then for the heating, what I use is one of these brew belts. This you can wrap around the fermenter itself, plug it into the heat source on the Inkbird, and then set your temperatures accordingly. Now the Inkbird is great because it can dial in the exact temperature range that you're searching for. So in that, say if it's an ale, you want to be in that sort of 20 degrees Celsius range, maybe 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And if it's a lager, about that 12 degrees Celsius or 52, 53, 54 degrees Fahrenheit range. Plug it in, set a range of temperature. So if it gets a degree hotter than that, the cooling system will turn on. If it gets a degree cooler than that, the heating will turn on and it will keep your ferment right in that zone where you want it. Better temperature control during your ferment, the better the end result on the beer is gonna be and the more consistent it is gonna be. So you wanna to try to stay consistent whenever possible and you wanna stay within the range of uh, temperatures that the manufacturer suggests so that you can get the best possible result from your fermentation. So everything's set up. The ink bird is set to 20 degrees, so that's what we wanted at. It's currently at 20.8 degrees, so it's a little warm. It's gonna start cooling in a little bit. And uh, the fermenter's inside the chest freezer. The brew belt is wrapped around it to provide heat when it needs heat. And the temperature probe is going into that thermal well so we can keep an eye on the temperature of the beer inside the fermenter itself. Now, the other great thing about using one of these chest freezers as your fermentation chamber is that it allows you to cold crash your beers at the end of the fermentation cycle. Now, cold crashing is the process of dropping the temperature down to just about freezing. And what happens when you do this is that any particles, any yeast, or maybe proteins that are still in suspension in the liquid will group together. They'll coagulate, become heavy, and then drop out of the beer, making the beer that much cleaner. They end up as a yeast cake at the bottom, and you try to not move any of that when you're transferring your beer over to say a corny keg. Now when you put your beer into a corny keg and you force carbonate it with CO2 gas, the gas goes into the liquid more readily if the liquid is cold. So cold crashing has the benefit of cleaning up your beer as well as making it easier to carbonate. So, a couple good reasons for why I went with this option, up to you to make a choice for yourself, but Keeping in mind that the temperature of your fermentation is really what's key here because keeping it within the range that is suggested by the manufacturer either for a lager or for an ale will give you a better result. You won't get uh, any fennels or, or those fusel alcohols that will throw off the flavor of the beer or you won't get a stuck ferment. So stick it right in the temperature range you want and you'll have a consistent result just about every time. I'm David Aiken for Checker Red Brewing. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, hey, if you have any comments, leave them down below. I'll be more than happy to respond to them. Uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe, and uh, wherever you are in the world, I hope you have a great brew day. We'll see you next time.